This is a Woodside Church Sunday. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you. I trust you are well this morning. Uh, my name is Martin. That's been introduced. I lead the team here at Woodside. It's my privilege to preach this morning. We have many different preachers that share God's word. Fantastic preachers, actually, but you've got me today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tabs. Uh, and so uh, we're going to be continuing uh, our series looking at um, 1 and 2 Samuel. But before we do that, I just want to share a bit of news. Some good news, actually. It's good to have some good news, isn't it? Uh, a few weeks ago, some of you will know if you're part of Woodside, if you've been around for a while, that we had some gift days. Uh, and there were two specific things that we were looking to raise money together for. And those two things was one, a leadership track. We believe that God's speaking to us about investing in the next generation of leaders. And so we were looking to raise £20,000 in order to release uh, some leaders into places uh, going forward. And the other thing we shared was uh, hoping to raise around 3% in our general giving, which goes towards the the vision, that we're the whole picture, if you like, of what God's called us to do together. And the result is... Okay, in terms of the leadership track, uh, we have raised together, thank you so much, £21,500. Hallelujah. And in terms of our general giving, uh, that has not gone up 3%, it's gone up 4%. Praise God. So thank you so much. Genuinely, thank you for your commitment, for your trust for your partnership with us. This is something we do together. We don't, as if you're familiar with with us as a church, you'll know that we're not funded from, from, from outside. It's what we bring, what God provides through us. And so we're so grateful. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm also grateful to God. It's like a, a, a sort of an affirmation. Keep going, guys. I'm with you. And it's, we corporately say that together at these moments, don't we? Uh, but thank you so much for your... Uh, kindness and your generosity. Well, back to the sermon. Good to share some good news though, isn't it? Okay, Uh, we're looking at 2 Samuel, excuse me, chapter 5, and the title is A New Type of King. A New Type of King. Now, what we're going to be looking at is a moment. It's almost like a a bit of, if this was a movie, this would be a a climatic moment, moment. Uh, when something that has been spoken of through all the chapters that we've been looking at, something that actually has been demonstrated earlier on in 1 Samuel 16, suddenly is fulfilled. And that is that David, who we would know of in the story as a small shepherd boy, do you remember that story when when, uh, Samuel went um, went to a place called Bethlehem? We've heard of Bethlehem. It's the same Bethlehem. He went to Bethlehem. He found a man called Jesse. And Jesse had a number of sons. And he looked along all the sons. And none of them was the man that God was choosing. And so Jesse was asked, do you have anyone else? And he said, well, I have one more son. That's David. He's out with the sheep, the shepherd. And God said, that's my man. And so David was brought forward. And he was anointed in that moment. See, when the Bible talks about anointing, which is physically oil being poured over someone as a physical representation of God choosing someone, but, all, but anointing in the Bible is in two ways, if you like. It's one thing that God says, that's the person. And then the second anointing is when God's people recognise that he's the man that God has chosen. And so actually we're looking today that second anointing moment when the tribes of Israel decide that yes, David is the man to be their king. It's a wonderful moment that fulfills so much of what we have been looking at together. Let me read to you from 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1. It goes like this. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said... We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, 
the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. In Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. Dawn and I have just come back from a, a week's holiday in North Wales. That's nice for us, isn't it? <laughs> so we had a lovely time. And it's a beautiful part of the country, if you're familiar with North Wales. And uh, here are some of our holiday snaps for you. No, no, they're not, sorry. <laughs> That'd be fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, not really. Um, fascinating thing about when you go to Wales, particularly uh, uh, that part of Wales, is wherever you look, you see the Snowdonia mountains. Thank you. And... And one of the things that we noticed, wherever we went, we saw this mountain range, but there was always Snowdon, that sort of the, the, the highest peak in that mountain range. In fact, it's not called Snowdon, is it? I'm not, it's called Yerwidva. Did, you, did I get the pronouncement? Pronounce, you know? Yerwidva, something like that. It's changed its name. But as you go around Snowdonia... Whenever you look up, you see this mountain range and then you see Snowdon as the highest peak. Now, why am I saying this to you? When we read the Old Testament, and particularly these verses, it would help us if we thought about a mountain range and a highest peak that we can see. Because wherever Dawn and I went, we saw this mountain range before us, but we could always see Snowdon, if I call it that for a moment. And when we read the Old Testament, and when we read particularly about King David, it's like we're seeing a narrative of David's life. We're seeing the, the mountain range, if you like, but they're supposed to, we're supposed to see the mountain snowed before us as well. And the mountain that the Bible is trying to communicate is Jesus Christ. And so when we look at this mountain range, again, we look at this narrative of David's life, Actually, what we're supposed to see is David's life, true story, but also supposed to see the mountain, Jesus Christ. In fact, the whole of the Old Testament points centrally to this character, this saviour Jesus. And so if you ever get puzzled about different parts of the Bible, you need to understand, well, actually, the Bible's trying to point us in a particular direction. And the amazing thing about it, as we walk around um, different parts of that part of North Wales, wherever we were, we could see the mountain range, but also wherever we went, we could see Snowdon. And that's how it should be for us as we look at our Bibles. And so we see this remarkable story of David being anointed by all the tribes, all the elders, all the people. But actually, as we get into these verses, we see there are things that are pointing not to David, but pointing to Jesus. The things that we see in these verses that are unpacking the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. There are things that are actually pointing to someone who is to come. This is what some people would describe as a foreshadowing. So we read things in the Old Testament, it's foreshadowing what's going to be happening in the New Testament. If you've ever watched movies uh, I'm sure you have. There are m many times movie makers use foreshadowing as a technique to say, look, there is some connection between what's happening here to what's happening there. I remember watching Star Wars years ago when Anakin Skywalker came on the scene. Yeah, we know who Anakin is? Yes, there's a spoiler alert coming up, by the way. Okay, Anakin was to become Darth Vader, right? Yes, have I spoiled it for you? I'm so sorry. But, but there's moments, if you watch the, the movies when Anakin is a young lad, when music of Darth Vader is played. Or there's a shadow cast onto a tent, and it's the shadow of Darth Vader. These are foreshadowing of someone who is to come. 
And so here we see in these verses, remarkable foreshadowing. I really got into this, as you can probably tell. I said, this is, this is Jesus, this is Jesus, this is Jesus. I'd love us to go through that together. We see this is what some would call a typology. This is the Old Testament pointing to the New Testament. Uh, others will say this is a, like a, a t- David was a type of Christ. He's a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Let me give you some examples as we get into these verses together. Uh, you're familiar with the, the, the show, Who Do You Think You Are? Well, this, is a bit, this first bit is a bit of a, who do you think you are, Jesus? It, it, it's where, where is the line? Where's the connection to what we're looking at today, to what we know and what was said of Jesus? Let me give you a few examples. Right at the beginning of Matthew, one of the Gospels, it describes the story of Jesus. It says this in verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Verse 6, it says this, And Jesse, we mentioned Jesse, didn't we? And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. It's interesting that Matthew was very keen to say that David was King David. Because he's going to describe about another king. The king, the mountain. And so Matthew is joining the dots up for us as we read these words. If we look on in Matthew, we see in Matthew 9, verse 27, this phrase being used of Jesus. When Jesus heals a blind uh, man and a mute man, later on we see it says this in 9, 27, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. Again, this line, this connection's been made. Matthew 12, 23, when a demon-possessed man was, was brought before Jesus, we read this, all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? Matthew 29 says these words, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. We used to sing an old song. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna to the king of kings. And so Matthew is joining these dots. And people were expecting the Messiah, the saviour, to have this connection to David. And one of the titles for this messianic figure was son of David. It's one of the ways... He was described. And you even have this connection with David, things that David said and things that David did, where you think, well, actually, those words seem more appropriate out of the lips of Jesus than out of the lips of David. Let me give you an example. Psalm 22. It's Jesus actually quoted one line from this psalm when he was on the cross. Do you remember when he shouted out the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But Jesus was quoting Psalm 22. Remarkable words. This is what Psalm 22 verse 16 says. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Wow, this is remarkable. These are words that David wrote, but they're actually words that seem more appropriate for Jesus to say, which is why Jesus quoted Psalm, the beginning of the Psalm 22 when he was on the cross. And so we see these connections, this link, and we see David as a type of Christ. And we're supposed to look at David and look at and understand the story of David, but see David like this mountain range where there's this narrative, these mountains, but actually we're supposed to look to the mountain. And that's what we see in these verses. Let me read these verses one more time to us. Can we go back to the very first slide, Matty? And then I want to pull out four signs. There's actually more than this, but four signs that point to Jesus. When I read these verses, just see if you can note a few in your head. You think, hang on a minute, this is speaking about someone else. This is, this is trying to link to someone else to come. So let me read these verses again and just see the connections. 
all the tribes of Israel. All the tribes. Okay. All the tribes of Israel came to David of, at Hebron and said, we are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people, Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to the king, David at Hebron, the king made a covenant, made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Let me pull out. You're probably ahead of me already. And that's good. Four signs from those verses that point to Jesus. The first is this. All tribes are united under the king. That's what we see in those verses. It reminds me of some verses in Revelation 7, which says this. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. You see, David united all the tribes. Jesus unites every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every people group to himself. Do you see the connection? It's wonderful, isn't it? Churches once said to me, Church, churches are like, uh, there's two places that are quite similar where you get such a diverse group of people, churches and service stations on a motorway. Yeah, if you go to a service station, you see all walks of life. Amen? Why are we saying amen to that? I'm not sure. But church is just beautifully rich in its diversity. It's how it should be. People from all walks of life, all stories, all ethnicities, all backgrounds, all political persuasion, <gasps> but united, united. You know, we are very different. Have you noticed? We, 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 we like different things. Not all of you like Crystal Palace. <laughs> I know. Sure. However, the Lord has enabled me to love you anyway. <laughs> We're united in Christ. Point number one. Point number two, David was described as our own flesh and blood. That's pointing to that Jesus came as a man, as a human, humbled himself. We read in Philippians, don't we, these words, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, so he was still divine, he was still God, did not consider equality with God something to be used in his own advantage, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. David was their own flesh and blood. There was a, a, a connection, there was an identity with who he was. There is an identification of Jesus becoming human with us. God is no longer distant. God has come and dwelt amongst humankind. This is so huge. This is so huge. When we share the, 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 the wine and, uh, and the bread together, we, we are recognising that it's his body and it's his blood. There, there's, there's something so, per, so personal about the way Jesus demonstrated his love for us. Thirdly, he was a shepherd king. In fact, there's many verses in the Old Testament that talks about God is going to shepherd his people. Uh, there's famous verses in Isaiah, which we don't really have time to look at, where there's always this promise that there will one day be a time when God will shepherd his people. And Jesus is described, he's like David. David was known as a shepherd ruler. This had never been seen before. A, sh a shepherd that, that looks out for his sheep first and foremost. And Jesus, picking up this theme in John 10, said these words, didn't he? I am 
the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is, he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. There's some great spelling up there, isn't there? Have you noticed? <laughs> it's right on here. <laughs> Let me move from Hebrews 13. Another example when Jesus was described as a shepherd. Hebrews 13, 20, I love these words. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The great shepherd refers to the covenant as well, doesn't it? Takes me to the fourth point. There was a covenant made with the people. Throughout God's relationship with mankind, there's always been different covenants. There's been different agreements. And so we see this example when we look at David. He, he makes a covenant and agreement with the people. But this is beautifully mirrored with the covenant, the new covenant, that Jesus made with all of mankind that was inaugurated in his death and his resurrection. This is what he said when he broke bread on the Last Supper. He said this in Matthew 26, verse 27. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. Some, of verses, some translations talk about of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. There's a new agreement, a covenant, a new relationship. Jesus is referring to our relationship was once of those who were in Adam, and now we are those who are in Christ. When what happened to Adam Im impacted the whole of creation. But now Jesus is saying there is a new covenant. And those who are in me walk into, receive, engage with, are blessed with all the life that Jesus gives them. Gives them. Romans 8, so Romans 5 verse 19 says it this way. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. If you've ever worked on an Excel spreadsheet, bear with me, okay. If you've ever done an equation and you've made an error in somewhere in the equation, you'll notice that that error repeats throughout the equation. Anyone that Excel spreadsheets? Do you understand? And, and what, what's happening here is what happened at the beginning of time. What happened when Adam fell, there was something that impacted the whole of creation. It's like an error was entered. And that impa impacted all of humankind, but it also Im impacted the whole of creation that God had made. But what Jesus is saying, and what these verses in Romans 5 help, is because of, of, of Christ's obedience and because of his death and resurrection, what was in place then has been completely removed because there's now a new covenant, a new relationship with God and his people. And those who are in Christ are now benefiting from all of the life that he brings. Hallelujah. So here we have an amazing story of a man called David who became king of all the tribes, all the elders, all the people recognised him as their king. But it points to Jesus for us. And for today, it points to this table. Now, some of you may be thinking, we only had communion a couple of weeks ago. Well, that's the beautiful thing about communion. Jesus didn't say do it every four weeks. or He just said, just said do it in remembrance of me. And so we deliberately don't have a pattern, but we do it regularly because it's such an important part of, of being a church family together. And as I was preparing, I thought, you know, 
the best way for us to respond is to break bread and drink wine together and celebrate all that Jesus is to us. So that's what I'd love us to do. But one thing I want to mention before we do that together, and that's this. There was a moment when the people recognised David as their king. And I just want us to take a moment to reflect on where you are, where I am, in our relationship with Jesus the King. Because this isn't just a something we do to remember it's also something we do to say Jesus I want to say again you are my king and you are my lord and I want to reaffirm my trust in you and maybe for some of us today maybe it's been a while since you've actually said Jesus I want to I want to make this clear again I'm trusting in you Maybe for some of us, there's been a period where you feel you've drifted away from God. And so this is a chance we say, actually, I want to I wanna place my trust in you again. Then maybe for some of us, as we were worshipping, I love that phrase, that come as you are, which Sharon used. Maybe for some of you, you just need to be reminded that you, you can come as you are. Because this is a covenant of grace. That's the new agreement. It's not on my performance or your performance. It's on the perfect performance of Jesus Christ. So encourage us, maybe, whatever place we find ourselves, to use this moment as a time to say, Lord, I want to say that you are the king of kings. You are the great mountain. You are the one that the whole of scripture points to and the whole of creation is centred on. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Shall we cast the band to join us? Thanks, guys. Love to pray for us in a minute, and I'm going to ask the band to lead. And then during that song, we're going to take the bread and wine together. If you've been around Woodside or you've done this before, you know how we like to do this. Uh, it is very much family. And so, if, you, if I say it this way, if you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, then this table is for you. Or if you want to make this a moment for you when you want to say in your heart, Jesus, I want to make you. In this moment, my Lord and my Saviour, that may be a coming back to Jesus or it may be the first time you've ever had that thought in your mind, or the bread and the wine is available for you to do that as well. To allow this to be a moment when you say, Jesus, okay, you are the king. You are the king. And so the band of the leaders in the song, we're going to worship and then I will lead us as we share the bread and wine together. Is that all right? Okay, let's come to God. Let me just pray. Jesus, we thank you that all of Scripture is pointing to you. We thank you for this remarkable man, David. We thank you that he was a king unto you. We thank you, Lord, that in his story, we see a greater story. We thank you that it points to a Jesus, to you, Lord, who came as a man, who came as the good shepherd who inaugurated a new covenant, the covenant of grace, and is now in glory as the risen King Jesus. Lord, we want to reflect again on your sacrifice, and we want to use this moment to say, Jesus, you are our King, and our Lord, and our Saviour, and we trust in you, and in you alone. Amen. Amen. So that is it. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. I hope you've been blessed by what you've heard here today. If you're new to Woodside and you want to find out more about who we are, what we do, what we believe, then please feel free to check out the link that is on the screen now. And if you would like to get in contact with us, then please also feel free to email the address that's on screen and one of our team will get back to you. We'd love to have you join us in person one week. We meet at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning and you can join us either over in Great Denham or at our building on Dover Crescent in Putney. So that is it. I hope you all have a wonderful week and I will see you soon. Thanks for joining us. For more information, visit woodsidechurch.com or follow us on social media.